Good evening, fellow ghouls and specters alike. It's your ghost host with the most tiki here. I'm like Blue Dragon 5. Here to engage in some haunted holiday hijinks by trudging through the catacombs and dusting off the cobwebs to recount our spooky selection of Halloween classics. So, light the jack-o'-lantern, suit up, and grab the candy dish as we revive and recount tonight's spooky selection, Scooby-Doo 2. Monsters Unleashed! (laughs) 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 Fart jokes! So many fart jokes! Alright. Alright, so Dragon, just diving right into it. Uh, You know, we're approaching Halloween, so we're on kind of our last few of the of the month and i gotta say i think this has been a really really solid lineup this included although i will say out of all the uh, out of all the stuff we've covered this might be the most imperfect i I, i'm mixed on this one dragon i really am like on some level i like the james gunn movie better on some level i like this one a little better i feel like this one is absolutely more faithful to the source material this one's got a ton of fan service uh it's got some really good character moments uh, if you can't tell, though, Dragon, I'm very put off by the uh, flatulence humor that is just running rampant throughout this uh, movie, specifically in the third act. And the frustrating thing about that is that the third act outside of the flatulence is awesome. Dragon, how would you feel if in if at the third act of Endgame there were, there were fart jokes? I mean, it's... I don't know, man. I, I feel like this movie, I really respect what it's trying to do. I really do feel like the original maybe grounded itself a little bit more, and that's coming from someone who thinks the original had one of the worst fart jokes of all time, the whole belch and fart off that Shaggy and Scooby have in the original movie. It's very disproportionate. The first movie had more fart jokes. Well, honestly, a longer fart joke, more accurately. That's what I'm saying. These are stretched throughout, and I feel like that's worse, Dragon, because... I can just take that one scene out of context to be like, all right, you know what? They were trying to go for a gutsy fart joke. It didn't really land, but whatever. But this is just like, man, as soon as they come up with the whole like, oh, Scoob gets nervous and he he gets gassy when he gets straight. God, they milk it for all it's worth. And it kind of ruins the whole damn movie for me in some respects, Dragon. I mean, I don't want to say it ruins the movie. I think this movie has a lot of good things going for it. I really do. I think it's... I honestly think out of all the theatrical Scooby-Doo movies, it's probably the best one. You know, if we're comparing it to the first one and to Scoob, especially Scoob. Well, remember, Tiki, Scoob technically, not theatrical. You know what I mean. I know, I know. That's what I'm saying, though. This movie scared the folks so much, we didn't... It took took years to get one, we still didn't get it. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, Dragon, um... Like I said, I think this movie's definitely got a lot of good stuff in its back pocket. I think it's a fun homage to the original, uh, to the original series. I think it's got a lot of, you know, it plays really well as kind of like an episode of Scooby-Doo. You know what I mean? It plays really well in terms of like, it's sort of like, what if we took the general format of a Scooby-Doo episode? Because the original movie kind of like, the original movie kind of broke down the formula in a more meta sort of way. And this one, I feel like, is more kind of an homage. You know what I mean? Where, like, this one kind of more feels like, all right, we're going to just take what you know and love about Scooby-Doo. We're not going to twist things up too much. We're not going to have have much meta humor, although there is some meta humor. But we're going to really be respectful for it outside of the flatulence. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, it's Like I said, the, my best comparison is if... Uh, you know, if we suddenly had fart jokes at the end of Endgame, it's just like, it, it just doesn't work. And it kind of like, you could see how it could like ruin the whole experience for you if you put yourself in that scenario. I think I gotta be honest, uh, you, you, analogy not one of your finest on that one, but okay. <laughs> I think you're really right. hung up on the fart jokes this time around, I gotta be honest. You're really, really kind of... I'm really not, not wrong, a fan of how they're, they're used in the third act, I don't know. Sure. 
Other yeah. than that, like I said, I've, this movie's got a lot of things going for it, which we'll get to. But uh, anyways. All right. Also, a little clarification. You know, James Gunn also wrote this one, too, right? Uh, I'm sorry. No, I didn't. Well, there you go. Did he direct the first one? No, he did not direct it. He didn't direct this one either. He wanted it. Son of a bitch. He wanted okay. to, but he wasn't able to. Well, I am just factually all over the place, aren't I? This is why I do the background. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, my thesis on uh, my overall thoughts on uh, Monsters Unleashed. Uh, for me, I think it's an improvement from the first one. It's not saying much, though, let's be honest. Uh, I feel here's the thing this thing has this movie has in its corner. It had a lot more potential in the premise, uh, and um, and oddly, uh, toys with ideas that were still not quite getting right years later, a la Scoob. Uh, but there was more of an attempt here. Oddly enough, there was more of like again, there was a skeleton. No pun intended. With oh god, you bet your ass there was a there was more of an attempt here than there was in Scoob. Don't even oh, don't even compare the two. Don't okay, get but, me started. But you see my point though is that again they're they're attempting kind of like the whole Shaggy Scooby narrative in a sense where we actually it's a little bit more here than it was there. But again, let's not let's not delve into that too much. So the point is like I I think. A lot of it is still, we're not letting James Gunn make the movies, uh, which is kind of the problem where, again, he's writing a script that gets very meddled with, as you can probably tell, and not yes, exactly. Yes, yes. A lot of studio meddling in this, and this this movie was more course correction from the, because you got to remember, critically, neither of these things did well, but financially, first movie to gangbusters. That's mm-hmm. the thing you got to remember. So the point is, it was the summer of Scooby-Doo, and it was the summer of Six Flags. You have to remember this. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go I ahead. remember from that first movie. Remember that Batman tease, which really ticked me off. Oh yes, oh yes. I was right there with you, buddy. <laughs> anyway, so the point being, I mean, you're right. This, this honestly, this is more of an adaptation of the Scooby Doo animated movies. Before, I mean, yes, more so the series, but just for the sake of the whole monsters, the, the actual monsters of it all. Like, we kind of tried to do with the first movie. I feel this is an adaptation of the Scooby-Doo anime movies uh, before, uh, before the first movie's whole meta-satire element, as you were kind of hinting at. Just, we're still not hitting the mark of what we're going, what we're aiming for, and I feel that really holds the movie back in a lot of places. Fart jokes aren't helping either, but I think there's a little more to it than that, but we'll, we'll break it down. Okay. <laughs> All right, so why don't you get into the background, then? A little bit of background, not a whole lot to add, but just to kind of put in perspective. So, of course, Scooby-Doo 2002 did really well financially, because how can you not? Again, Summer Six Flags, as the man said. Uh, so they greenlight a sequel, because, again, like what's one of the most valuable Warner Brothers commodities? No, not that one, thinking of Batman. <laughs> the other one. <laughs> Scooby-Doo. Um, so we greenlight Maybe the one sequel. day we'll get a live-action Batman-Scooby-Doo crossover, Dragon. That would be amazing. <laughs> Oh my god, that, that'd be a, that'd be awesome. All right, so <laughs> anyway, so point being, we green light uh, we green light the sequel. Uh, we bring back the same team. Unfortunately, no questions asked at all here, which is like, hey, we're bringing back the same team. I get we're bringing back the cast, bring back the writer. Not bad, but do we have to bring back the same director? Do we have to do that? Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's, no, it's kind of, not... this feels like a movie that James Gunn could have directed himself. It is, it is. Uh, so the studio, they, again, they continue to, uh, they continue to kind of uh, rain on uh, James Gunn's ideas on, on this movie. Because, again, he, he continued trying to get some of the stuff in from the first movie. Uh, obviously refocused it. They, they kind of put him in the direction of, you know, we're going to try to do the, um, we're going to try to do the series a little bit more instead of, like, kind of the meta commentary on Scooby uh-huh. in general. Which, again, is not a bad move. I can respect that. Honestly, what they did is kind of the Inspector Gadget move. Which is we we have the first movie, which again is kind of a we're we're doing kind of a, an adaptation where we're kind of we're, we're changing a few things around, and then we get to the sec the sequel, the direct video sequel, and uh, we're uh, we're looking at okay, let's um, yeah, let's let, let's try and uh, let, let's try and do this a little bit more close to the series, you know. Let's, let's right, like, again, I believe you're like the first person to bring up Inspector Gadget two in like ten years. Congratulations. Yes, yeah, sad but true. But you see what I mean, though. It's it's kind of in the same. So, like, is Inspector Gadget two actually worth watching? Like, is it more like the show? 
Well, again, I have a like for me, my so bad it's good as the Inspector Gadget movie. Where I mean, I I I have oh. nostalgia for it. It's like a guilt. Let, sorry, not, not so much bad. Uh, so bad it's good. It's more so it's a guilty pleasure for me. I do like uh-huh. it, but God help me that I like it. You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> right. I, you know, I like the, the Inspector Gadget movie. And the sequel is worth checking out if you're interested in the first one, at least. I mean, it, it definitely makes for a really interesting double feature. They're both different movies, but they're both quite quite interesting. The second one's a little bit. Well, more I am interesting. very familiar with the first one, and I don't feel like revisiting it. Well, the second one's more in line with. The cartoon which is interesting that's the thing anyway again like if you're saying oh my god it's like it's it's, it's the same thing no folks it's not the same thing as being the cartoon it's just a little similar <laughs> right right I mean, basically french store a lot like the car anyways anyway, my point being they kind of went claw right dragon what do they at least get claw right they get him a lot that cl- is pretty they get him a lot closer yeah I'm that saying, was like the main thing that pisses me off about that movie. Still, I, mean, I want to wanna say you don't, let me put, you don't see Claw again. So it's pretty much it's cl- it's close as they're gonna get, I guess. To it, so, you know, it's you know. So wait, just by virtue of you not seeing Claw again, that's why they get him right. I'm saying they obscure him and everything, give him a deeper voice. I mean, they make him close to to the, the but he doesn't have like the cool metal spike glove or anything. You know what I mean? It's, it's I'm saying it's closer. All right, that's what I'm saying. It's a lot closer. All right, all right, gotcha, gotcha. Anyway. <laughs> My point is to try to do a sequel more in line with the property of all of that. Hence all the monster nods and the monsters unleashed, all ghosts and the faux ghost of it all. <laughs> As a response to the critics, uh, you know, they, they shut down James Gunn's LGBT Velma idea. <laughs> which, again, it kind of wanted the tease up on the first movie, which they then kind of, they're, they're kind of like, okay, let's, let's not do that. And then they completely shut it down here with the Seth Green of it all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this movie, as big surprise, surprise, didn't perform well. Uh, it was more like a direct video I don't think it was, but it feels like if, if you didn't know this thing's released theatrical, you'd imagine it's a direct video in a sense, wouldn't you? You know, I kind of like the hokey effects. I think it goes with the franchise, but yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not trying to take, say direct video like it's a dirty word, but it just feels like, yeah, this this feels like it, it wouldn't have gotten quite the theatrical treatment. I mean, then again, Dragon, then again, I mean, it's not like the first movie's effects have hold have held up all that well either. True. So um, there's also like a Game Boy Advance tie-in thing for the post credit scene for this movie. I don't know if you stuck around to the end or not, but it's a oh, really dated oh, post credit oh scene. Like, Scooby, it's like if, pe- if kids watch the movie, they stay to the end. They get like a little code for the Game Boy Advance game. Oh my god, wow. <laughs> that's, that's, oh man. Crazy. So uh, here's the big I thing. actually want to like get the Game Boy Advance game because I'm sure I could get it on eBay for like a couple bucks and insert the code and see what it does. You know what's crazy? The code is like the most unimaginative code. It's not really a secret code at all. It's very obvious. What is it? SD2. Oh, wow. <laughs> at least I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Like, it has like a few letters. I'm pretty sure SD2 is like just the code. I think it's just three letters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so last and most important thing. So there were plans for a third movie. And James Gunn was supposed to write and direct this one. Which says something. Which says, okay, we really didn't like the direction of the second one. So we want to really, okay, we're going to finally get rid of this Goss Snell guy. We're going to bring in James Gunn to do the whole the whole shebang this time. <laughs> There's supposed to be going to Scotland. There's supposed to be like a sympathetic, the monsters are going to be sympathetic. And kind of like the victims of the story. And like maybe Scooby and Shag are going to kind of change their views on monsters and stuff. It was going to be... It's going to be quite interesting. Of course, that didn't happen because it didn't perform well financially. And uh, we got a bunch of TV movie prequels going forward. So that's where Oh, we're God, at. yes. And then we got Scoob, and it all just went to shit. Yep. Yep. <laughs> right. Oh, we're not fans of Scoob on this channel, Dragon. All right. Uh, so let's see. I guess from there we just go into, uh, go into the characters, right? Or no, the plot. The plot. By all means, Dragon, regale us. All right, plot in a nutshell, kids. So, Mystery Inc., they're back! They're back! Mystery <laughs> Inc.'s back uh, for the opening of the Criminology Museum um, of their past conquest. All, like, the unmaskings and ghosts and monsters and cases all kept in a little, little museum. Very Flash Museum-esque. Uh, the exhibits come to life at the behest of this mysterious masked figure who we don't give a name. <laughs> And uh, and he's stealing the whole lot, uh, stealing the whole lot, and it's up to Mystery Inc. to find the costumes, and more importantly, how the heck they're being turned into real monsters. Along the way, Shaggy and Scooby, they try to step up, Velma's in love, and uh, Fred and Daphne, they face the media. All culminating in a monster mash of epic proportions, unmaskings, and of course, a dance party, because why not? 
It was 2006 Tricket. <laughs> four. Oh, four. Oh, God, I'm getting my... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that that still fits. That still fits. All right. That whole decade. <laughs> All right, so, uh, I don't know, Dragon, for some reason, this feels like it came out later than it did, for, for me at least. Because I guess it just came... I, I guess the first one just came out, like, right on the cusp of when I was getting, like, when I was, like, getting too embarrassed to see movies like this in the theater. All right. Anyways, uh, Shaggy and Scooby. Yes, much like the uh, the Scooby gang, we're going to it's time to split up and look for clues within our characters, folks. We're going to do in kind of little duos here for our for our characters uh, in terms of the split up groups here. So Shaggy and Scooby. All right. So goddamn Matthew Lillard has never been better dragon like in anything, honestly. Um I, I, this is just a tour de force performance for him. I, I, I think physically, he just has Shaggy down, like way more than he, the first one. He had the voice down for sure. This movie, just the physical comedy with him, absolutely shines through. Did you notice that? Like how he's got like the uh, the lanky postures and stuff like that. He, he really looks straight out of the cartoon. That he does. Again, Lillard's always been the best part of these movies. And again, so Absolutely. much so that he was very rightfully incorporated into the cartoons. He kind of, he kind of took on the case. Should have been into Scoob! True. I'm sorry. <laughs> you really gotta let some of that <laughs> go, man. Come on. I mean, it's not like Will Forte is that much of a bigger celebrity than Matthew Lillard anyways. That's what really bothers me. Yeah, but seriously, I love when, you know, of course, like, <laughs> if you think his performance of, of Shag is good here, you take it yet again, the Mystery Incorporated show, I think, still on Netflix at the, <laughs> this oh, point. Oh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> seriously, he's really I... good in that. Anyway, yeah, so point being, yeah, Lillard's fantastic. And honestly, the duo is Shag and Scooby here. They're very much the heart and the touchstone of the franchise they tend to be. And I love that right now, uh, within their arc in the movie, they're facing... Of the reality of their roles you know they're kind of the bumbling screw-ups or like kind of to the to themselves the burden to their friends which leads to a really interesting idea of this movie they're going to make a proactive change they're going to try and actually solve the mystery try to prove their worth to the gang like we're, we're not just we're not the burdens we actually contribute to the group i feel like this is about the most meta that this movie gets is that uh shaggy and scooby kind of like realize that whenever they actually do something right it's like they're literally like falling ass backwards into it exactly and that that's again the one of the biggest uh, kind of feathers in the movie's cap that we're kind of addressing it for the first time here like sure. yeah these guys they really they are kind of they kind of why would they stick around but again we're kind of less addressing it from the outside like certain of the movies that were made nameless <laughs> and uh in this case we are we're just kind of really kind of addressing it from the more the more sympathetic route here, we're, we're seeing them realize it, like, you know, it's like kids learning that the parents have grievances with them, sort of, like, we're seeing that, you know, they're over here in the gang kind of talk about them, like, when they're not even there, like, well, I know we shouldn't have, you know, we, we shouldn't have handed them the ropes and everything, we should have, like, you know, we, we, we should have figured sketch, Shaggy and Scooby, they're gonna do what they do, and the, y your heart melts for these guys, that doesn't it? They're having a montage without us. Which is just, that's a great joke. <laughs> it's a great joke, but it leads into a beautiful scene, Dragon. It leads into what I think is Lillard's best perform, best live action performance as Shaggy, at least. Uh, that scene where he's, like, kind of reflecting on it all. You know, he is getting a little bit meta with how they are kind of failures in the grand scheme of things. And, uh... And then, of course, this movie does a lot to uh, bring it back with Thelma's whole, like, oh, I, I think you guys are heroes. Like, you guys are so free and willing to be yourself, faults and all. And, uh, okay, it, it, it's all a really good arc. I think, like I said, I think Lillard, absolutely wonderful in the role, both, you know, in terms of just the physical comedy, the voice, and also getting a little bit of heart. Like, there, there are definitely a lot of moments of heart with Shaggy, more so than the first movie. And again, so rarely do we really get, get into, like, you know, Shaggy outside the comic relief role, just kind of really... Again, we that's the thing these movies have done through Lillard. Again, the first movie held during the breakup of the gang, your, more, your heart broke for Shaggy, and it's like, uh -huh. hey guys, let's stick together. It's like, oh, poor Shaggy. And again, like, Shaggy kind of taking, taking charge a little bit there, saving his pal and stuff. Again, Shaggy, Shaggy trying to maintain the status quo, and here it's like he's trying to change up the status quo. You know what, guys? We Gotta, yeah, yeah, just good, good, good stuff in that regard. Just wish we kind of, I wish we could have uncomplicated, and just focused that, and just kind of let that kind of play before we're distracting with a few other things in this movie. <laughs> right, but, Scooby. Uh, yeah. I think Scooby has some good moments, but I also feel like he has a lot of 
I mean, I, I'm going to bring this term back, Dragon. Here's a term that hasn't been floated around the internet in a while. He's got some big-lipped alligator moments. Uh, what, what spring? Oh, you mean the dancing? The dancing, yes. All the dancing is very big-lipped alligator-esque. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of it, Dragon. I don't know. I mean, look, you're right, it doesn't aid the story. Well, the only thing, the only reason there is so we can get exposed and get thrown out of the place, but you could have done it any number of ways. It's just, you know... It goes on too long. I understand why it's there. It just goes on too long. Gosnell has an obsession with dancing. I can't I can't tell you why. It just, it just <laughs> right. does. But, I mean, on the, on the plus side, though, again, with this whole... Uh, basically, they have, like, an arc of, uh, of, of weaponizing their shtick, which kind of leads to Scooby-Doo having the, his big awesome moment, his endgame moment, if you're going awesome. to use that. <laughs> uh, you know, he's, he's saving his friends and that awesome, uh, you know, kind of. But again, Scooby, the thing about it, he's saving the day in an intentional way. He's facing it head four. He's not stumbling into it this time. He's using the fire extinguisher and, you know, and, you know uh, taking some names there. It's pretty, pretty cool. He has this big kind of John McClane moment. Yeah, <laughs> Scooby, do we do? You know, it's big. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely some good heroic moments with him. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to harp on it too much, but, you know, just to state it one more time for the record, sir, <laughs> um, I'm not a fan of the fart jokes, especially when we get into the whole, like, oh, Scoob gets an uh, upset stomach when he's nervous. It's like, okay, we're going to we're gonna have that, we're going to plant that in there, and we're just going to milk it for all it's worth. But, you know what humor I am a fan of, Dragon? You know what had me cracking up? What? The transformation scene. Here's the thing, okay? So the transformation <laughs> scene, I think... It played a lot better for me back then, back in the day when I first saw this. Because <laughs> again, it's just it's fun, but it's if you look at it now, I don't think it holds up as well. You know, they're actually. Why do you think it holds up? I'm curious because I, I, this is the first time I've seen it, and I, I, the, the one thing I knew about it was from the trailer. Like, look, Scoob, we're buff. <laughs> I mean, look. You know what's funny? They cut out an awesome part. There was like a uh, James Gunn pitched an idea. They cut, and it was a really good idea. Okay, it was. Remember when he transforms in the Tasmanian Devil? Yes. Yes. Instead of originally it was supposed to be, he transforms into the two D version of Scooby Doo. <laughs> that, that would be great. Now, they didn't do that. I presume for the reason that you, you would have. I think the audience would have like, why can't we have that the whole time? And that would <laughs> right. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's probably what would end up there. But I yeah. will say with the transformation scene, not a fan of the shaggy woman bit. That's, that what, I, that's what I'm saying. Elements like that don't make. I don't think better. I don't think the shaggy woman bit goes on for too long though. And then other than that, I don't really think there's anything too offensive about it. Yeah, I mean you're right. I'm just saying that's like the chink in the armor that makes you pause. Like, do we really need this scene though? But it's, but again, like before, you're having a good time. Dragon, right? we need intelligent Scooby. I know, that's what I'm saying. Intelligent that's... Scooby is gold, man. See, that's what I'm saying. That's the fun... Buff way. Shaggy, I can take or leave. I personally enjoyed Buff Shaggy. I can see why people would be turned off by it, especially with the effects. But fucking genius Scooby, man. That Oh my god, that was wonderful. I really liked the energy of the scene when I first saw it. I love the whole, like, just they're playing the... Dun, 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 dun. You know, playing the music, and there's this big uh -huh. moment of, like, I want to stay like this forever. He's throwing the... <laughs> I don't know right, why. Right. Just, that was a cool That was a cool beat to that scene. And it, I don't know. It was a really... Again, it was a, it's a fun scene. I don't know if we necessarily need it, but it's, I guess, it's still fun a little <laughs> bit, you know? It's like, again, genius Scooby is the high mark. You can't beat it. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so so just the bridge. Let me connect our themes here. Unless you got anything for Shag and Scooby. I'm good. I'm good. So uh, another great thing about this whole Shag and Scooby thing, I love how the arc, as you kind of hinted at a little bit earlier, I love how it kind of parallels the Velma arc of uh, you know of you know with, you know with uh, the the uh, basically like Shag and Scooby, uh, Velma's story is 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 a great uh, companion piece in concept to her. You know, wanting to be more like Shag and Scooby, and her she's she's trying to come out of her shell as well. Like they're trying to be more like Velma, and she's trying to be more like them, essentially. <laughs> Speaking of which, Velma and Patrick, let's let's talk about these two crazy kids. All right. Uh, first of all, Linda Cartellini. It, it's nice to see her again after Muppets now. <laughs> Good old Cartolini. And again, <laughs> do you like some Carlini? You need some Carlini fix. Dead to me. Ah, ah, okay, okay. Really good. Anyways, uh, Linda Cartolini is just, uh, she, she's another person who just, honestly, I think all of the cast, like, this is a damn good cast, right? Him. It is. Just overall, just these four, it, like, you 
really couldn't ask for a better cast at this time. You really couldn't have. But uh, Linda Cardellini, I, I think she does kill it. I, you know, it's uh, she, she really does have a lot of great moments here with, uh, you know, with self-reflection. And it is, like, one of the more emotional sides of Velma that we've seen. Yes. Uh, and that, again, I love that you know we're, uh, while we're while we're not going full tilt with the with, with you know James Gunn's uh, you know vision of, of of Velma, which is kind of a Whedon-y vision. Let's be honest. Which, I mean, for all we it know, it really doesn't can... bother me that we're not. I mean, like I'm not saying I'm against that. I'm just saying like this is you know like I if that would have been in the movie, I feel like it would have been distracting from the fact that this movie has so much other otherwise so much fan service that sticks really close to the material. Sure. I mean, look, I get why we're not doing that too, because again, if the time to do that would have been the first movie, which we didn't do. You can't just kind of introduce that now. It's gonna right, right. I mean, nowadays probably more more than then, but especially then, you probably would not have been able to get away with that. <laughs> that making ways, but but regardless, I'm saying working what we have here is that again. I, I love that you know Velma here. She's kind of we're, we're kind of challenging her to you know to change and look outside the mystery. That's kind of the main story we're doing here. She's very self conscious, the complete opposite of Shaggy and Scooby, which complements the other story very well. Uh, which leads her to overcompensate exactly like Shaggy and Scooby are again. Some uh, some of the other great Shaggy and Scooby stuff too is they're they're looking for clues and they're finding they're doing undercover work, <laughs> which leads to a lot of fun and silly stuff. And so Velma here, she's uh, she her version of overcompensating. She's wearing like this this orange uh, like this orange cat suit thing. All right, and here's where I'm going to get maybe a little bit divisive. Um, I thought the fart jokes, quote unquote, involving the leather suit were funny. Well, no, those are fine. That was an imp- that was an improvisation, apparently, too. Or was it? Yeah. I don't know. What I'm saying. Like, I that, that's the thing, Dragon. Like, I think that's a great example of like a fart joke, quote unquote, where like, it, you know, it, it's the awkwardness of the situation, and Cardellini's like, you know, both Cardellini and uh, Seth Green just had like a great kind of like rapport, you know, in the moment with that stuff. So uh, that's a good example of uh, you know humor like that that I can actually appreciate. So it's not like I'm just completely anti fart joke. Well, again, I know you're not anti fart joke. I, I'll admit, starting off with such vitriol for the fart joke did not help your case in that regard. But just, <laughs> no, but but, uh, but yeah, this um, what we get here is is great. But I'm saying like the it's like the re the callback to the Scoop level of fart joke from the original Scooby Doo. That's the problem. It's like why is that? Why have to do a dog fart joke with Scooby Doo? It's just I've. It's like the one thing you don't want to toy with with the with the property of Scooby. You ever want to think about these things? Like Eddie yeah, Frazier. Unfortunately, with uh, with the live action Scooby Doo movies, they were like kind of obsessed with the idea. Again, I hate doing like you know the bathroom here with Scooby Doo because again, cartoon dogs. You don't have to worry about that sort of thing. That's the charm of cartoon <laughs> right, dogs exactly. and these these TV dogs like Eddie. It's only like it's an off screen joke. We never you know. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. It's like so I hate it when we do it. So basically, regard for you, it's more you hate the callback humor with, with the fart joke. That's the more spec- specificity you want to hit. There. Anyway, so um, Seth Green. We talked about him for a second. So Seth Green. Uh, I think of course they got him pretty much because the robot chicken thing. Like, hey, you guys gonna want to record some uh, robot chicken sketches for me? Yeah, sure. Why don't you come do it? You know, why don't you? Well, now we know who he got him. Yeah, I, I, I honestly think his character is maybe a little bit too much of a good red herring because he is super sketchy. Honestly, I, well, one I love that he's literally a red herring with the red hair and everything, which is perfect. right, right, right. Like in another, in a perfect world, we would have actually made this with all like you know we have a flashback to them, you know, the fris- the young frisbee playing oh version of mystery. Oh my god! Yes, imagine. yes. Again, it's not in the movie as it is, and it wouldn't be room for it. But upon a rewrite, imagine if red herring was you know. <laughs> <laughs> Dragon, one yeah. of these days we're gonna get red herring in a Scooby Doo movie. And we're gonna one of these days. Fans. We're gonna lose our collect. We're gonna be the biggest fans of that once that <laughs> we, we will. We will. Oh my god, it's red herring until they do like a pup named Scooby Doo movie. It's it's just gonna be pretty much it's like <laughs> Red Herring. So again, I like that we kind of uh we somewhat literalized it here with, with, with Seth Green. But seriously, I, I gotta tell you, Seth Green just kinda of played straight as he is in this movie. He's quite fun. And again, a nice match for Velma. So you know, I like he that is, he's yeah. again doesn't get a lot of development, but I get it, he was charming. I kinda of like him. All right. Okay, so Fred and Daphne. Um, I, I think Freddie Prince Jr. Again, once again, fucking excellent casting. I think he kills it. Yeah, I gotta be honest though. I think uh, I think oh he suffers most with the material. I think we dumbed down Fred a little too much in this movie. 
I I don't agree. I don't agree. I, I think that. Yeah, I I think that with Fred, uh, it's just the fact that they give him such a personality in this movie. That's what I like. It's like stupid or not. I mean, you know, Fred's never really been the brightest bulb in the shack, anyways. So. Uh, I, I, I don't know, man. I really, like, I do appreciate a lot of his moments, and I, I do think that he plays up the comedy quite well. Uh, I mean, I don't think him or Daphne have a lot to do in this movie, but I, I just think that Freddie Prince Jr., like, really, uh, you know, can really play it. Right. Well, I mean, here's what I like. I like that, you know, we're, we're dealing, Freddie's kind of the face man for Mystery Incorporated, and he's, yeah. he's kind of, he's dealing with the brand and the business side of things. Uh, you know, like the, the little business that, you know, kind of little mystery solving group that could have now developed a following, kind of a fan base, and they're dealing with media stuff, which obviously lands lands Fred in hot water. He's just, he's kind of a dope when it comes to, to, to the mini press conference, as it were, for the kind of the on-the-fly TMZ and <laughs> Uh, and of course, I do like this. Of course, in real life, uh, Freddie Prince Jr. and uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar married, and you kind of see the married chemistry in this film, which is quite nice. You know, it kind of like shows like a nice partnership between Fred and Daphne, and that they're really there for each other. And Daphne being the brains, Fred being the face, is getting all the flack. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, my favorite thing is I love that Daphne. I completely forgot about this. I love how Daphne just she calls the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love like she's kind of like oh my god you're the bad guys wait what <laughs> yeah you're you're behind all this <laughs> quite good and again, that's that's the thing we've been kind of hitting with Daphne lately is, hey, let's get Daphne more to do and let's see again because right now we it's le- it's less uh, it's less on the nose like the Buffy of it all of course like hey we got Sarah Michelle Gellar she can do a lot of fighting let's use that it's a little less on the nose like her whole thing self defense and she's a fighter fighty fight yeah and no that's... it's more so self worth than self defense. Exactly, you know, it's uh, like here she's it's just oh yeah, she just happens to be able to fight, but also she's you know, she's the one giving Fred the Fred. Maybe you shouldn't do the little press things. We haven't we haven't caught anyone yet. You know, okay, I suspect. will say I I think the out of context stuff with Fred in the press is pretty hilarious. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna say I'm gonna say something like Coolsville sucks, and of course later on Coolsville usually. sucks. <laughs> that to me yeah. was the biggest laugh in the movie. Trey. <laughs> 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 all right so um but i mean i i think would you agree though out of the bunch they're probably the least developed though like, they yeah really... out of the bunch they're the least developed sure but sure. there's that that's really nothing new with scooby-doo true all right okay and that brings us to just kind of our quote-unquote villains of the piece okay uh yeah so we have old man wiggles and the monsters just general monsters so, oh my god, Peter Boyle, what a treat. Absolutely, Peter Boyle, uh, and, you know, not was it Peter Boyle, Tiggy, it's Peter, Old Man Wickles, technically, um, the original Scooby-Doo film, the very yeah, first yeah, one. Yeah, 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 I got that. Which was yeah. really cool, and uh, I love exploring the aftermath of the meddling kids undoing, you know, like he was undoing from the meddling kids. Like, how, how, I what love happened? the bar full of the, full of the unmasked villains, that was a great set piece. Absolutely. Even though it had the extended dance scene, it was still pretty fun. Sure. And I'd say, I'll, I, honestly, I'd cut the dance scene a break for me. It's because that was uh, it was kind of like a cool effect. And if you remember, they're doing like a practice outside of the Scooby head. It's a practical guy in a suit for those dance scenes. Uh-huh. I don't know. It was something like it was kind of, well, yeah, it was kind of a little cute. It's uh, basically it's like a cute say, I'll give it a pass. Sort of like I said, I just think it went go, went on a little too long. It just some editing could have helped it. I don't. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to get down its throat. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I love the idea of, like, this guy he recently got out of prison. So I don't know how long he's been, at least, like, 10, possibly 20 years, for all we know, for, <laughs> for what he's done. I don't know how, Scooby, how long the Scooby gang's uh, been in business, given how old the, you know, the actors are compared to, you know, the teens of the Scooby gang. We don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, I just love this idea that he's uh, he's trying to uh, use his, uh, his elaborate, uh, you know, his elaborate kind of uh, theme park construction skills to, uh, to do, like, a kind of a summer camp, a mining summer camp for kids. <laughs> so again, it's like the most. I love its sophisticated real estate scam. This is where the James Gunn writing really comes into play really cleverly. Here, it's like, oh yeah, so old man Winkles is trying to cash in, He's trying to get children. To I get really money. did like this idea. Basically, it's kind of like the Tom Sawyer, uh, you know, the whitewashing thing. The uh, I mean, the white picket fence, right? Yeah, the white picket. Yeah, it's technically called whitewashing. Even oh. though I know that. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, the whole. Um... You know, the whole like yeah we'll we'll have uh, we'll 
well, basically we're going to charge kids to go to the summer camp and we're going to get free manual labor. <laughs> <laughs> get free minors, literally. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, this is, uh, again, it's just, he was, uh, he was absolutely a highlight of, of the movie, especially of all the great actors. Could have and of course, well, how can we not? A little bit of young Frankenstein worked in there. A little bit, you know, like a little bit of Peter Boyle uh, royalty with another horror-based stuff. Comedy yeah, horror. great. Uh, we do a deep dive with all the monsters, all of the actual uh, monsters from Ghost, Ghost and Monsters and Masked Guys. From, uh, Some from... of the ones that got the biggest reactions from me were uh, Minor 49er <laughs> and uh, then the uh, the scuba diving ghost. I forgot his name. Uh, I believe that's, I think it's just Captain Cutler. Like he's the Yeah, guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Of course, that scuba ghost, uh, that, that always stuck out to me from the opening sequence. Of course. Um you also have like the zombie, which again is like very again. It's not the creeper, but it's the next best thing. You know, like, mm-hmm. you know, like you know, I love it's a pra- I love we had some practical suits on some of these guys. We like do, we do, yeah. Which look really cool. Of course, uh, I think the coolest one of the bunch uh, for me, uh, Cotton Candy Glob. <laughs> Hallelujah! I just that was such a great because I, I was like, are we ever going to see the Cotton Candy Glob? Oh my God, we saw the Cotton Candy Glob, and of course, like, what's the <laughs> one monster Scooby and Shaggy would not be scared of? Cotton Candy Glob makes sense. Jesus. Also, the tar the tar monsters. I oh man, I don't think he holds up as well as he once did. Uh, when you look at him, uh, it's like it's a cool idea. Like, I always really liked the tar monsters because I remember them from uh, Cyber Chase from uh-huh. uh, Cyber Chase. Of course, got a lot of love for that. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's just they're really great with the deep pools there, uh, practical effects and some of them, and of course so the pterodactyl uh, uh, ghost and the and the skeleton men. Which, of course, is based on one of the most insane concepts for a Scooby-Doo villain there's ever been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love the practical flashback to uh, Tim Blake Nelson as as the, the pterodactyl ghost, too, by the way. Seeing him in the actual like, practical, like almost like vulture-like suit, which is mm-hmm. kind of really cool. All right. Okay, so pros and cons? Yeah, yeah let's, let's, let's dive into the pros and cons. All right. Uh, so yeah, pros. Like I said, I think this movie has got a lot of good fan service. Uh, you know, in the sense of like, if you don't know what the fan service is, you don't really need to. But if you get what it is, it's it's great. It's a lot of fun. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I think all the performances across the board are pretty excellent and on key and very in character. Uh, really great exploration of Shaggy and Velma's character in particular. Excellent writing there. Again, acknowledging the whole Shaggy Scooby pattern as the springboard for the story. Uh, again, we still haven't quite cracked this by 2020, but I can respect the attempt. And I think again, the the, the start of this is really good. Uh huh. Okay, the faux ghost, big big MVP of the movie. Again, it's the best and most James Gunny concept in the film. Again, just this. Uh, again, it seems, sounds like with that whole thing for the third movie he wants to do, he kind of was able to delve into it here with the whole uh, sympathy for the monsters, sympathy for the the guys undone by the meddling kids, and again these kind of these lost souls in this in this uh, Scooby Doo faux bar. Right. Uh, I got some great Easter eggs. The sign has like all the classic faces and neon from the opening, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but my, my I think my favorite part of the entire film is the scene between Peter Boyle and Matthew Lillard. When he gives him advice, where uh, just he's really remorseful, like Shaggy's overplayed. Ah, I'm cre-, <laughs> the, the, like the McCreepy guy, and uh, he's in the, the green suit and everything. And he's uh, asking, "Have you been doing anything creepy lately?" And he says, "Look, t- take. T- I'm not much for giving advice, but because your brother's nose deformity, I'm going to give you some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get out of this game while you can. It's, it's, this life's nothing to admire. Maybe we wanted to be different than what we were because we thought, you know, there's something wrong with who we were in the first place. Tiki, I think that's such a great intimate scene, but also had we just focused on it's a little bit more in the Scooby Shaggy of it all, it's a perfect setup in parallel to their arc for what their whole thing is. Like they're trying to be something they're not, just like this guy. It's great. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, again, the Cools vote, uh, the Coolzonian Criminology Museum, very flash. I just love the Flash Museum pool. It's awesome. I always like putting all these costumes somewhere. It also kind of reminds me of, uh, I know you haven't seen the Conjury movies, but they have this room where they keep all the cursed objects in their house. It kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Yeah. Um, um and just generally speaking, I, I love the location of the museum. It's kind of like a big set piece of the movie. I think that's, uh, I think that works well. Uh, again, we already kind of mentioned like some of the monsters, like the cotton candy glob, but also just one that there is a, a pup named Scooby Doo reference. I'm pretty sure in this, uh, Chickenstein. 
<laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Why couldn't he have come to life of all the things they stole, man? Come on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, uh, the, oh, ran, I got to talk about the randomonium. Okay, so I love the idea that we acknowledge within this mining place, like why we have like the ghostly glow and all this stuff. Is love the idea like the ghost? It, it's like this fuel for the machine, but also it's like just this mining stuff that just leaves this, that ghostly green trail everywhere. <laughs> so don't we acknowledge that. Yeah. Uh, oh, we actually go to a haunted house for a change in school. Not like the fake haunted house from the theme park island, but go to a legit like you know haunted house with like you know very. It's modeled after the one in the openings and with all like, the cool traps and everything in it. Mm-hmm. All right. I, I, I'm out of stuff, man. I don't know. Well, what about cons, Tiki? Well, yeah, I know. We're, we'll transition into cons. Yeah. Um. Okay, cons. Obviously, I'm not a big fan of some of the Fletchwins humor. We've already gone over that. I feel like... Uh, I mean, honestly, there's not a lot to talk about in terms of cons. I feel like the plot could have been maybe a little, little bit tighter. Um... But, I mean, the thing about this movie is that it's so self-aware that I feel like a lot of the plot holes and, and cons and everything that I can point out, the movie kind of, like, already points them out, you know what I mean? Like like what you just said with the uh, with the mining substance, and, you know, it, it's all kind of played to be ridiculous, so in that way, I feel like this movie's a little bit critic-proof. In a sense, yeah, I mean, there's this one thing I can't shake, though. Uh, Shaggy and Scooby, uh, is as wonderfully bumbling as they, as they can be, and just kind of, like, the free spirits they are, there's this one thing I can't quite forgive in this movie. Shaggy and Scooby, they create the army of monsters and ghosts by playing DJ on the big important thing. Right. That's the one thing I don't think I can forget. I can, I can look past a lot, but it's like, really, that just looks bad <laughs> when you look at that. It level. looks bad on them, and also it's kind of a stupid way to explain how the monsters come alive to begin mm -hmm. with. So that's it's, what it's I'm saying. Of, it's like, that's the one it's thing. kind of bad that's... in both regards, honestly. And, I mean, look, we've kind of covered some of the kind of the smaller... Again, it's basically it's like a, it's an accumulation of smaller cons with a lot of stuff, where, again, it's... Uh, a few, few dumb jokes, like, right in the round tables, like, he's a ghost, that shouldn't work. You know, like, the billboard stuff, like, you know, like, you know, the, the Jared Teradax crash little baby billboard, ha, huh, funny, right, uh, it's, uh, and also a little bit of a plot hole, why that, we, when we, we call out a really smart question move, we just distract from it, because we have no, uh, we have no answer, like, why do you have the monster book in your, in your house, old man Wickles, and then, hey, we heard an explosion from the sequence down there, let's go. <laughs> right. so, yeah, why is he? No, 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 don't go, don't go away. You ask him why he has the book there. Why does he have the book? But I mean, like the the movie literally acknowledges that convenient items will pop up out of nowhere, though. That's fair. So, like I said, it, it, critic proof. Yeah, no, <laughs> one other thing that is not critic proof, and that's all I got for cons. Okay, okay. Uh, Alicia Silverstone. Not oh great. man! Uh, first of all, super duper predictable. Like, I had never seen this movie, I didn't know any spoilers, but, like, right away I was like, yeah, she's she's the bad guy, she's trying to paint, uh, you know, she's trying to paint them in a bad light, yep, yep. <laughs> uh, and Alicia Silverstone, I mean, just, I I, I don't know, man. I feel bad putting her down, but I, just, I don't think she's good. I just don't think she's good at all. Just generally speaking, just blanket statement. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying, I mean, I, look, I know I haven't seen her in everything, but every time I see her, it's just really, she... She it's just nothing. not great. Yeah, I, I hear you. She's got nothing. This is, I'm watching this. She's got nothing here, man. <laughs> I mean, also, it's really telling that our big villain that she portrays does not have a name, doesn't have like a shtick or anything. Yep. Like, yep. Let me be clear. So, the thing I should acknowledge, kind of like, uh, kind of quasi pro con sort of thing, I guess, is that. I, I like the idea, the concept of what her villain's all about. I love the idea within the theme of the movie and everything with the Shaggy and Scooby and, like, you know, challenging some of our Scooby players to change and, like, you know, try and make a change or be a little different than themselves and kind of realize they're good enough as they are, but, you know, open themselves up to possibilities, all that sort of stuff. Her whole thing's about unmasking Mystery Inc. for who they are and their faults and their failings, which I think that's a great idea, but again, our villain just pops up, says something, and disappears. I don't really get to really linger on or anything, you know? It's like there's very disparate elements. Yeah, I, I think the villain plot in general is pretty much the weakest element of the movie. We already acknowledged how weird the actual monsters coming back to life was. 
I mean, overall, it, it's just had had this not been done, a lot of this movie is kind of done already, in my opinion, done better in Scooby Doo Cyber Chase. Think about it, because we we actualize the monsters, but digitally in cyberspace. You know, we we go in there, we kind of look at Scooby Doo throughout the ages, get a self reflective take. It's quite fun. I don't know. It's, Cyber Chase feels like the better version of this movie to me. I I don't necessarily agree to that. Just I, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to pick that up. I mean, look, just in certain respects, I guess. I hear what you're saying. I'm just saying, saying like, this for a live-action movie. I mean, Cyber Chase is clearly, like, you know, for a live-action movie, this is pretty decent. I mean, you're right. Probably an unfair comparison. I'll admit to that, sure. But I don't know. It's like certain... Anyway, okay, so I guess that's all I got for pros and cons. So I guess uh, finally, let's wrap this puppy up. Okay, um, yeah, so... Mm, 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 mm. All right, folks, that's the end of tonight's... No, 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 no. I mean Final Thoughts, Tiki. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I have not been on point tonight, Dragon. No. <laughs> Final Thoughts. Final Thoughts. All right, um, just very simply put, I think this is a, a lot of good fan service. It's, it's not the neatest story in the world, and there's... Definitely some disparate elements to it, but overall, it's uh, it's definitely, I think, an improvement over the first movie. Uh, final thoughts for me again. Uh, you know, these live action Scooby Doo movies again, some they have interesting premises, but again, it just seems like I don't know, sound like broke record. It sounds like they're kind of done better in the animated films in terms of these. We're actualizing the monsters, and this movie uh, specifically does that a lot better than the first one does. Like, how are we going to do real monsters? Well. I mean, does it make a lot of sense? No, but we're having fun with it. You know, it feels more in line with Scooby Doo than just like random beach parties and stuff, and like we're doing these weird gremlin looking things. You know, it's uh, it's it's a lot closer. And look, I want to be clear. I'm not just. I know we name drop James Gunn as as if it's the holy tome here, but just I'm not saying James Gunn would have necessarily saved things. Given you gotta remember, I don't know James Gunn's tone for that first Scooby Doo movie was supposed to be like an R rated movie. Which wouldn't have been for a general audience, obviously, but for the longtime Scooby fans, they probably would have really liked it. Probably. And uh, like, I wonder what James Gunn would do now with Scooby Doo, honestly, just given now all the stuff he's been through and just like seeing kind of kind of movies all, all over the place. He could make a like an all for all ages Scooby Doo movie. It's quite clever, for all we know. I don't know. I honestly feel like the studios would let him do an R rated Scooby Doo movie nowadays. I mean, that could work too. That's what I'm saying. We can get away with things. That, that, <laughs> I don't know what kind of movie James Gunn would make with Scooby Doo now. He's time to ruminate on it. So he's got interesting ideas with it, but again, it just feels like the director was no good for these projects, which just complicates everything. That's why we can't just have a firm like this was a major win versus. Is the first bring back the cast man i want to see this cast again that's what i'm saying but unfortunately a good cast is not a great movie makes sometimes you got a great cast again i think the director (sighs) killed these movies in certain respects but again this movie vast improvement for the first one it's it's got a lot more going for which makes you want to see more see him get it right you know you want to see scooby-doo gotten right on the big screen which unfortunately we still we still have, uh, have, have, have yet to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's again, unfortunately, this kind of left such a bad taste in the mouth. Still no theatrical Scooby-Doo, unfortunately, for other reasons, but still. Uh, it's, it's just a cruel twist of fate with the Scooby-Doo franchise. Again, better in 2002, but uh, I got a little, little surface level, but still an improvement. I'll, I'll take the win. I'll take the win. <laughs> All right, folks, that's the end of tonight's spooky selection. And our spirits grow weary. But they'll be stronger than ever next time as we engage in even more haunted holiday hijinks. (laughs) 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 Poolsville sucks.